Hi, I'm Troy Hunt, and welcome to another episode of Hello CISO. Today I want to talk about something that should be at the front of mind for all IT leaders, and not just IT leaders, but software developers, security engineers, and really anyone responsible for anything technical in an organization. And that is secrets management and infrastructure. Let's begin by talking about what secret management is, and perhaps first of all, what secrets themselves are. We always used to think of secrets as things like usernames and passwords, and that's certainly still the case, but we have many more secrets within an organization these days. So for example, we have private keys, we have one-time passwords, we have certificates. We have many other things than just those two strings which we traditionally think of, the username and the password. In most of these cases, when we talk about secrets, we're talking about things that machines use to gain access to other things. And of course, that applies equally to passwords, certificates, private keys, other things which we would not want to disclose to other parties. These days, we're also not just talking about secrets used on physical machines. Of course, many of our machines are virtual, either running on premise or increasingly running in the cloud. And we're not just talking about secrets that humans exchange with machines either. Very often we're talking about a secret which one machine will exchange with another machine. What this all leads us to is a much more complex infrastructure today than what we've had in the past. Particularly once we start to consider things like hybrid infrastructure. So what happens when we have machines on premise and machines in the cloud and they're needing to communicate secrets with each other? If I'm an IT leader, I'm really focusing on two things as it relates to secrets. And the first one is quite obvious. I want to make sure that the right people and the right machines have access to those secrets. So access control is very important. But the second thing that I'm focusing on is the who, what, when and why of access to secrets. So I want audit trails. I want to know who gained access to the secret, whether that be a person or a machine, what the secret was, when it happened, because this would be a very important part of any sort of, say, forensic analysis. And then I want to know why. What did they need this secret for? And of course, what did they then do with it? Our environments today are a lot more sophisticated and complex than what they were only a few short years ago. And as a result, we need a much more nuanced approach to the way we manage our secrets. I really want to understand how my services are going to communicate with each other, how they're going to exchange secrets securely. And of course, I want the two things I just covered, namely to ensure the right people and the right machines have access to secrets and also have that audit trail of the who, what, when and why. Let's spend some time defining the problem. And as important as it is to understand who has access to which secrets. There's a very important first step, which is simply to understand what the secrets are. And this comes back to the old asset management problem. Most organizations are not aware of all of the assets, which include secrets, that they have within their organization. So that's our starting point. We need to establish a baseline of what we have. And then once we know what assets we have in the organization, which secret assets, of course, we have, we can start to have the discussion about who needs access to those secrets. And then, of course, how we're going to audit that access. Understanding the secrets we have is still really only the starting point. And even that can be quite a laborious exercise. I remember back in my previous corporate life, many of our secrets were literally printed out and stored in a safe in the car park. And we would have to go to the compliance officer and get her to unlock the safe in order to access things like private keys. Once we start to understand what secrets we have, we need to start to ask ourselves, how do these secrets flow through, say, the development process? What happens to, let's say, service account passwords? Where do they go? How do we manage them? Once we understand more about the way secrets flow through the development process, 
we can start to have a discussion about how we protect the developer infrastructure. Let's take an example of this, and I'll pick a real practical one here, one I've had to deal with myself in the past. Let's take Stripe as a payment processor. Now, in order to process payments with Stripe, you need a token. That token is a secret because that is the thing that allows you to take payments. Where does that token exist? Where are you going to store that? Is it going to be in one place? Is it going to be in many places? And then very importantly, what happens if you need to rotate that token? You might rotate it because that's the practice of the organization. You might rotate it because someone has left the company and you need to ensure that they don't have that secret. You might rotate it because you believe that it might have been compromised. So in each of these cases, it's a question of not just where the secret is, how you store it, who has access to it, but how you manage the life cycle of the secret as well. If we had, for example, one single source of truth and the secret would always be in that one location, no longer replicated into different places, we could lock that one location down like Fort Knox, keep it as secure as possible. And we would always know where to find the secret because it would always be in that one place. And we'd also always know where to rotate the secret if something like an API key needs to change in the future. Now this can feel counterintuitive to some IT professionals. They might say, well, this is really just all of your eggs in one basket in that one location. So the key then comes down to how do we protect that location? Because if we can do that, and we can do it well, that makes the management of that secret so much more efficient. One important part of secrets management is meeting compliance obligations. So for example, FIPS compliance or PCI compliance if you're dealing with payment cards. Now compliance doesn't necessarily have to be a hard problem, but it does require some forethought and some careful management. Let's look at a real world precedent where poor secrets management did lead to a serious security incident. And I'm talking about the Stack Overflow incident of May 2019, where an attacker broke into the Stack Overflow infrastructure by exploiting a bug that got them into their development environment with elevated privileges. Now Stack Overflow was pretty transparent when they reported on what happened. And they said, look, one of the problems they had was just bad secrets hygiene. They had secrets spread all over the place, in code, in build systems, in application settings. And that's not particularly unusual, but in Stack Overflow's case, that did ultimately lead to their security incident. One of the things they did after the incident was to make secrets write only. The only things that could read the secrets were the machines that needed to use them. Now this made them completely useless to anyone else that could come along and find those secrets themselves. One thing to really keep in mind with Stack Overflow is it is a very sophisticated organization and it's staffed with extremely competent people, a bunch of people I know myself and have a huge amount of respect for. So this incident shows us that even very well-coordinated organizations do still struggle with securely managing their secrets. Shoring things up in the Stack Overflow environment would have required a very methodical approach. They would have had to understand precisely what secrets they had in that environment and ensured that they were now centralized and managed in a very systematic way. So if you're tasked with overhauling secrets management in your organization, you're going to need to begin by understanding which services need access to which secrets and where they're stored. This will help you in ensuring that access is only granted to those entities that actually need access to the secrets. So that's the good old principle of least privilege right there. You'll almost certainly want to turn to a third party to help you with your secrets management. Now there are a bunch of software products out there to help you do that. Which one should you use? Well, it depends. I can't tell you that. This is going to be part of the journey for you to establish which is the right one that fits your needs in your specific environment. Each cloud provider, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, just as a few examples, all have secret management services built into them. So a logical place to start might be to see in your cloud provider of choice, what is the solution that they offer? Then there's the behemoth of secrets management, HashiCorp. HashiCorp does things that don't just include secrets management, but say certificate signing and encryption as a service. 
They are the big player in this space and perhaps they're the right fit for your organization. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention one password. Of course, a collaborator on this video series, they've just launched their own product, 1Password Secrets Automation. I don't want to turn this into a product pitch, so I won't go into detail here. But I will put a link in the video description. You can go and have a look at what secrets management looks like the 1Password way. That's all for this episode of Hello CISO. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Join me in the next one when we talk about common sense security policies and on the flip side, the bullshit ones. If you've enjoyed this video as part of the Hello CISO series, then please give it a like and subscribe to the 1Password YouTube channel for more videos like this.